It's good to have you with us today. We have a number of visitors because of our baptism, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to join us today. Uh, we're excited for those who are following the Lord in obedience to his command and being baptized this morning. We want to read a couple of verses as we begin, and actually with the baptism, these verses are significant, but they're more in line with the series of messages that we are doing. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 and 2 says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So we're excited this morning to have four that are following the Lord in obedience to his command and are uh, going to be publicly professing their faith in Christ. Baptism is one of two ordinances given to the local church. The first is the Lord's table, uh, and the next is believer's baptism. Baptism does not change our standing before God. This is nothing to do with our salvation. This is an act of obedience after one has come to faith in Jesus Christ, and they publicly want to display and profess their faith to those that are within the family. And so this morning we have four, and we're excited because next Sunday we have five. And so it is a great time in the ministry here at Golden Harvest, and we are truly thanking God for what he is doing. So we're going to begin this morning with Andrea Mennick. And if I could have the men that are going to be assisting, if they could come. Andrea Medic, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes, I have. Upon your profession of faith, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his death.
but we've had some days that we've baptized when people have stepped into the tank and the first sound that comes out of their mouth is <laughs> because it's so cold. Uh, this is almost like bath water. Um, Tommy Sharon, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And upon the profession of your faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection.
All right. Well, we have a few announcements to get to this morning, and uh, we're going to get right into them today. All right. We want to, uh, this past Wednesday night was our the wrap up of our uh, yearly Awana program, and uh, there are a few pictures to go through in relationship to the award ceremony. Uh, we're grateful for all the work that our Awana clubbers put in uh, over this last year. And I think there's at least one or two clubbers here this morning that are going to be assisting with the uh, special music this morning. So we're excited about that. All right. Because of Juana has ended, some of our young families, in order for them to come on Wednesday nights to our Bible study, are in need of some help with child care. Uh, so if you can help us out, uh, we've had the sign-up sheet in the hallway for uh, a couple of Sundays now. And there are a total of there's one zero people that have signed up. Uh, so if you can help us on a Wednesday night, uh, what we're basically asking for is just for the hour that the uh, Bible study is on, if you can read stories, play some games with the kids, just keep them from running on the road, that would be appreciated. All right? So please sign up uh, on the way out today. Uh, we are having baptismal service again next Sunday, and we're excited about that. Uh, and uh, there are, the, I think most of the ones that are being baptized next Sunday are here this morning. So we're looking forward to uh, getting them in the tank, and they've been able to see this morning how painless it is to be baptized. And so uh, join us next Sunday at 11 o'clock again. Uh, group Repair Day, it was scheduled for the 13th. Uh, I met with the deacons, a few of the deacons just before the service, and they have asked if we can bump that to May 27th because we don't want to interfere at all with Mother's Day, uh, and the 13th is a Mother's Day weekend. So if you're able to help, now let me, let me put it another way. Uh, we have two men under the age of 60 that have offered to help. The rest are over 60. So young men, it's time to step up. Your church needs you. So if you can talk to Earl or Dean after the service and let them know that you plan on being here, that would be most appreciated. We're going to seal the roof on that day and uh, stop any further leaks so that we can get all the work done that needs to be done in the uh, kitchen. All right. Next Steps class is going to begin next Sunday. If you are here and you're fairly new and you've never been through the Next Steps class and you're kind of curious what Golden Harvest is all about, let me encourage you to come at 10 o'clock and take in the Next Steps class. Uh, we talk about who we are as a church, what we believe, where we're headed, and how you can fit into the big picture, and uh, areas of service you might be able to be involved in, and we would love for you to take part in that. You don't have to join after taking it, but if you plan on joining, you have to go through the Next Steps class. So we would ask you to join us next Sunday at 10 o'clock, and we'll be down into the Sunday School Ring. Spring cleanup is May 27th, so ladies, I'm depending on you to get your husbands signed up and coming to help with the roof repair, all right? Uh, if, if I can depend on anybody, it's the wives that are going to push their husbands to do the job. All right, so I'm asking you to get your man here that day, okay? Uh, just let us know if you're planning on coming. We have a whole list of things that need to be done, just getting the building ready for the spring, and the new pastor is he comes in July, all right? Uh, at the annual business meeting, we approved the purchase of a generator. And the generator is installed and it's functioning properly, uh, and we're excited about that. But if you feel led to assist in either the purchase of the generator or the kitchen renovations, uh, then please mark your gift accordingly. All right.
bed. <laughs> 56 looks much better. <laughs>
one roared. And if you've been standing anywhere close, you hear Brother Daniel say, Hear me talk about me, forget it, boy. I came here to stay.
hope you know the Lord is your Savior. It's been a great service so far, other than that little interruption with the birthday cake. But, uh, it's always great to be in God's house and with his people. Take your Bibles with me this morning. I think our children are on their way out already, so take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 3 with me. We began to look a couple of weeks ago uh, at our identity in Christ, who I am in Christ. Uh, and I am a firm believer that there are a lot of Christians that do not fully comprehend or understand their position in Jesus Christ, what they have in him, who they are in him. And they struggle with their identity. And they listen to the devil, and the devil whispers constantly in their ear that they're not enough, that they're, they're weak, they're failure, they, they just don't measure up, they'll never be as good as the other person in the pew. My friends, if you think that this morning, I can tell you the source of that. I can tell you where it's coming from. And it certainly is not coming from the God of the universe. It is coming from our nemesis. It's coming from our enemy. The devil constantly feeds us a lie that we are not enough, that we do not measure up, and that we are failures. When you begin to read scripture and you begin to understand its authority in our lives, and that's the first place we started, was that we began to look at the fact that if we're going to turn to the word of God to find what our identity is, we have to be satisfied and settled on the authority of Scripture, that it is the inspired, inerrant, preserved Word of God. And so we studied that last a uh, couple of weeks ago as we began this series. And then last week, we began to look at the source of our identity. And we didn't get too far into it. We looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, which says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. This morning, I want to go back and look at a character that we spent a few weeks looking at just back a few months ago, and that's Moses. We spent some time looking in Exodus at Moses and freedom from bondage. This was a series that we did. But we want to look at Moses because I believe that Moses' identity and who God said he was and what God said he was going to do with him is important for us this morning. So let's read uh, Exodus chapter 3. We're going to read verse 1 through 15, and then we're going to skip over to chapter 4. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster. For I know their sorrows. Let me stop there and say this this morning. God knows your sorrows this morning too. He knows where you are. He knows the burdens you're carrying. He knows the, the, the things that weigh heavy on your heart. Just as he did his people. Verse 8 says, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land unto a good land. And a land uh, large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. Now I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee 
under Pharaoh. You know, I can only imagine that up until this point, Moses was good. You know, Moses was right there with God. God has seen the oppression of the, the Egyptians upon my people, and uh, he's going to deliver them. And then God says, come now, I will send you. Can't you imagine the stomach just dry? <laughs> the heart stopped beating. The mouth suddenly go dry. He was going to send the least likely candidate. Verse 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now down to chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before him. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. I hate to keep stopping in the middle of my reading, but I want you to notice something here because everything that God is saying to Moses requires a level of faith that is beyond what Moses was capable of at that moment in time. I don't know about you, but if I'm ever going to try and catch a snake, I'm not catching them by the tail. Right? But God told Moses, reach out and take it by the tail. And you know that for a millisecond, there was a thought that went through Moses' head. He said, Lord, you do have the wrong guy. I am not the character that you're walking for this job. But he reached out by faith and took that snake by the tail. And the tail returned. The snake became, once again, a rod in the hand. Verse 5 that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand unto his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand unto thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, they will not believe that he neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it on the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood unto the dry land. Now, here come the excuses. Verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. 
the anger, anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for these moments as we come to the word of God. And Father, I pray that you may truly help us to comprehend this morning the source of our identity, that it is not found by our last name, it's not found by the job that we work, it's not found by the neighborhood in which we live or the community. But Father, as born again the children of God, our identity is found in Jesus Christ alone. And Father, I pray that we may be able to see that very clearly this morning through the word of God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From an earthly perspective, Moses was really a bit of a castaway. He was 80 years old. Some would consider him a migrant worker who had settled into a routine for the remainder of his life. His earthly track record appeared somewhat cowardly, convoluted, and checkered. His thoughts about himself were not necessarily positive. His feelings and desires persuaded him that he was insufficient and incapable. Now that may sound familiar to you this morning because that may be exactly how you feel about yourself. I'm insufficient. I'm not enough in and of myself. I'm incapable of doing anything significant for God. So we read this passage. And we've seen Moses' response to God's call. We've seen his feelings and his desires. That they had persuaded him that he was not able to do this. So let me ask you this morning, who really had an accurate view of Moses? Was it Moses himself, or was it the creator of Moses? Was it God that had the clearest view, the best understanding of who Moses was? What are you trusting in this morning? as the most reliable source to help you understand your life, yourself, your family, your circumstances? Are you trusting in your experiences from the past? Are you trusting in your feelings? Or are you trusting in the God of the universe who made you in his image? A God who cannot lie who is giving you, even in this moment, your next breath, and who holds your eternity in your hands. I want you to consider three things this morning. These are not the main points of my message. These are just three, so you can just take these and you don't have to pay for these at all, all right? Number one, I want you to consider that God has perfect knowledge of you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you are capable of. He knows what you are thinking, even before the thoughts are formed in your mind. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6, clearly tells us this. He knows your words before you speak them. He knows every question, every loving thought, and every secret sin that is rooted in your life. Jeremiah 17, and verse 10. Number two, God has complete ownership of you. He has perfect knowledge of you. And he has perfect and complete ownership of you. Now I think this is reasonably significant in a generation that claims my body, my rights, my choice. God reminds us that these conclusions are based upon a complete and utter lie. This is not my body. This is God's body. God has redeemed me. God has purchased me. He has created me. He has formed me the way that I am, and I am completely his. He has complete ownership of each and every one of us. 
And thirdly, I want you to consider the fact that God has ultimate authority over you. Psalm 103, verse 19, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12, 22, and Matthew 28 and verse 18. Two of the most significant questions that Moses was trying to answer, and which you and I need to clearly answer, are these. Who is God? And who am I? Who is God? Is he real? And if he's real, does he have any say in my life? And secondly, who am I? I mean, who am I in the world in which we live today? How insignificant or significant am I? I think Moses was dealing with those. And so I think that it's good for us to understand that our identity can only be found in one place. And that is in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 17 verse 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. If you recall the life of Moses, you understand that he was rescued from the bulrushes by Pharaoh's daughter, and he was raised in Pharaoh's household for the first 40 years of his life. And uh, there was an incident that Moses involved himself in when he saw some of his own people, the Jews, being mistreated by an Egyptian taskmaster. And so Moses intervened, and in the course of intervening, he killed this Egyptian taskmaster. And he hid the body in the sand. The next day, he saw a couple of Israelites fighting with each other. And he tried to intervene to keep peace, and one of them said, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? At that moment in time, Moses knew that his secret was out. And so he didn't run home to pack his shaving kit. He just made a beeline and got out of Egypt as fast as he could. The next 40 years of Moses' life, he lives with his father-in-law. Now, some of you men might be saying, oh, boy. <laughs> Moses lived with his father-in-law, Jethro, and he kept the sheep. He was a shepherd. And I'm sure that by the time he got to the end of that 40 years, that second 40 years, so he's approaching 80, he's thinking to himself, life has passed me by. I am done. This is as good as it's going to get. I am in the only place God is going to use me because I am unusable. Can you not imagine that in your mind? I mean, I've killed an Egyptian. I've broken one of God's laws. I am living under my father-in-law's roof. I don't even have a home of my own, and my identity is wrapped up in a bunch of stinky sheep. And I'm 80. Now, I'm turning 65 this week, and I'm thinking life has passed me by. <laughs> now, I know that for most of you that are in here that are young, that seems like forever, but don't blink because you'll be there. And some of you reached 65 just a couple of weeks ago, and some of you have been there for a few months, a few years. <laughs> Moses is approaching 80, and he has got to be thinking, there's nothing else going to happen in my life. There's nothing going to change. My circumstances are what they are. He had learned in Egypt the skills of worldly leadership how to be a leader of men. But in God's school of the desert, he'd been taught some qualities of spiritual leadership. He'd been taught patience, maturity, sensitivity. And as he's out for a walk with the sheep one day, he sees a bush that's on fire. And it catches his attention because usually when a bush burned, it would burn up and the flames would begin to die down almost immediately. I don't know if you've ever uh, lit a Christmas tree on fire, uh, but if you have, you know what I'm thinking. Uh, they burn intensely for a short period of time, and then the flames 
die down as the needles are burned up and the flames begin to diminish. But as Moses looks at this bush and sees it burning, it is not changing. The intensity is still the same. And so he turns aside to see it, and God says, don't come any closer. Take your shoes off, because the ground on which you're standing is holy ground. This is, this is brand new experience for Moses. I mean, he never, in all the time he's lived, in 80 years, he'd never seen anything like this. And God begins to speak to him. We don't have any record anywhere else in Scripture that prior to this moment in time, God addressed him by name or directly. So this is a brand new experience. Not only the burning bush, but God is speaking directly to him, addressing him as an individual. So Moses is intrigued. And he is thinking, wow, this is awesome. You know, I am, I am in the presence of God. And he's right there on the edge of the sea. You ever been there where you're, you're uh, whether it's a concert or you're, you're some lecture and, and you're just into it and you're, you're right on the edge of your seat and you can't wait to get more information. And I think that's where Moses was until God said, come here. I'm going to send you bring my people out of Egypt. I only imagine Moses start backpedaling. <laughs> you know? Trying to, hey, whoa, 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 God, wait a minute, wait a minute. And first he, he says, well, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to they're not going to accept what I say. And God says, throw down what's in your hand, that rod, and it becomes a snake. He takes it up, and it becomes a rod again. And then God says, put your hand in your coat and he does, and when he takes it out, it is white as snow. It's filled with leprosy. And then God says, put it back in, and he comes out, and it's clean again. And those are the signs that God gave to Moses to give him credibility or authority. So that when Israel began to question whether or not he was truly sent by God, these would be signs that would be such that they would make the message valid. <coughs> that they would begin to believe him. And then Moses thinks, wait a minute, you know, uh, I'm going to have to talk to people. I I'm going to have to stand up in front of somebody. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to address not only crowds, but I'm going to have to address Pharaoh. You ever met anybody famous? I mean, like, really famous? I bumped into a, a, a gospel singer on a cruise um, one day. My wife and I were turning the corner, and we bumped into Squire Parsons. And I, I just, I couldn't put two words together. I was so dumbstruck. I'm dumbstruck most of the time. But anyway, that's a side issue. Moses is going to have to stand in front of the most powerful man in the world and address him. So God, God's made some sort of mistake here. Obviously, he has. I can't talk to people. I, I, I'm not built for public address. Like that, somebody else. Aaron. Get Aaron. He'll do it. And God says, who made your tongue? Who made your mouth? Who gifted you? God did. My friends, the reality of how the devil tries to make us feel and the lies that he begins to feed us and try to tell us are such that we totally throw out the window anything that God may have to say. You may believe this morning, I cannot serve God. I can't do anything for him. I'm, I'm totally incapable. I'm not able to stand in front of people. I couldn't teach a Sunday school class. I can't put three words together. And God says, who made your mouth? 
Who gave you the ability to speak? I think this morning there are four things I want to give you. If you're looking at the clock at all, you may say, you're just getting to the point now. <laughs> I'm going to give them to you real quick. Number one, God often shows up in unexpected ways. Verse one clearly shows that. He showed up in the midst of a burning bush. Verse one of chapter three. Moses was on the back side of the desert. He was probably in a position where he believed that he couldn't get any further away from Egypt and he couldn't get any further away from God than on the back side of the desert, on the side of Mount Horeb, and, uh, and, and with a bunch of smelly sheep. But in the midst of all of that, God showed up. Folks, I'm, I'm praying that God shows up in your life. Mm. I'm praying that God shows up and makes himself known in your life in such a powerful way that it will not be mistaken for anything other than a moving of God. Amen. God shows up in an unexpected way. Number two, God often shows up when we're engaged in the ordinary things of life. Moses was just busy living his life. He was busy doing the stuff he always did. I, I can only imagine if I spent my days with a bunch of sheep, I probably would have them named. And I probably would know each one and I, I you know, sit with them and cuddle them. talk to them. And, cuddle. No, I wouldn't cuddle them. <laughs> I would be aware that Moses is there and God shows up. But all Moses is doing is the normal things of life. The third thing I think is important is in verses 3 through 4, and that is that God's call is a call to turn aside and listen to him. It's a call to turn aside and listen to what he says. Amen. Not what the devil's telling you this morning. Not what he's trying to convince you of. Not that you are imperfect and incapable and that you're a failure and that you're weak and you can't do anything. You need to listen to God. And that's why we started with the authority of Scripture because that is where we find our identity. Amen. It is through what the Bible says that we find who we are in Jesus Christ. So God's call is a call to turn aside and listen to him. And my friends, I believe this morning for each and every one of us as children of God, if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with him and you love him and you want to serve him, I believe that God's call on your life today is to just listen to him. Amen. Listen to what he says. And then fourthly, God delights in using ordinary things and ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary events. Did you get that? Let me get it to you again. God delights in using ordinary things and ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary events. Chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. So don't sit here this morning and say, Preacher, I can't, I can't do anything in the ministry of the church. I can't help. I can't teach a Sunday school class. I can't help with junior church. I can't do a Wednesday night kids program. <laughs> Who created you? Who called you? What does God say about you? Are you accepting it? Or are you listening to the devil? What did the burning bush experience do for Moses? I think it solidified God's call. It made clear to him that God wanted to move him from his comfortable existence into a work for which he was destined. Moses was never the same again after that burning bush experience. He had a new intimacy with God. He knew God as a friend. The experience provided him with a, the new motivation. His past failures were forgotten. 
No longer was Moses defined as a murderer. Now he was defined as a friend of God. Now think about it. When God says, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I mean, those were the superstars of the faith at that time. That'd be like God saying to you, hey, listen, I want you to serve me in this capacity. I am the God of Billy Graham. And I am the God of D.L. Moody. And I am the God of Billy Sunday. And I am the God of Charles Stanley. And I'm the God of David Jeremiah. And you would say to yourself, who am I in the midst of those superstars? God delights in using ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Amen. And the same can be true for us. God's job description for you will not be the same as it was for Moses. But it will be just as real and just as challenging. God looks not for ability, he looks for availability. And when we look at Moses, we see someone that we have trouble relating to because of all that God did through him. For us, Moses is one of the superstars of the faith. I mean, he's, he, look at what he did. I mean, there's nobody like Moses. The Jews even today revere Moses. You're not Moses, you're you. And God, I believe, wants to do something through you, with you, and in you. He took a snot-nosed kid that got saved at the age of 15. And called him to preach. God can use anybody. Yeah. If you use a donkey to speak, <laughs> he can use you. <laughs> My friends, we're the ones that limit ourselves in the service that we can provide to God or his ministries. Because we choose to listen to the wrong source. Your source of your identity is not found in what the devil says about you. It's found in what God says about <coughs> you this morning. And you need to listen to the right source. Amen? Amen. I listen to the fake news. Right? Which is what the devil tries to feed us. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, for your love for us. For how you have done so much and we are as the choir sang this morning if we are children of God if we have placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ we are redeemed we are a new people a royal priesthood we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ God help us not to limit ourselves but to believe what you say, to accept what you say, and to obey what you say. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing it. Sing in closing. Grace greater than ours.
grace. I trust that you've experienced it. You're with us this morning, and you are not certain that if you were to die today that you'd be on your way to heaven. My friends, the Bible says you can know. These things are written. First John tells us that you may know that you have eternal life. And so we would love nothing more than to sit down with you with an open Bible and tell you how you can know for certain that you are a child of God, that you are on your way to heaven, and that you're a member of his family. If we can do that for you this morning, please speak to me on the way out, or one of our men or women would be, we'd love to just sit down and share with you what God has to say. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for those who have followed you in obedience to your command and been through the waters of believers' baptism. I pray your blessing upon them. For those who will follow next week, we pray that you would bless them as well. Father, we love you. We are thankful to be members of the family. Yes. And I pray that you help us to truly understand who we are and the source of that identity. We will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.
Brian's song and your gun. Get out of there. Talking to 